Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We are confirming acquisition of your signal. You are live in 5, 4, 3, 2... Hello and welcome to episode 35 of Gardeners of the Galaxy, the podcast for all of the sentient beings in the universe who have a passion for plants. I am Emma the Space Gardener and I will be your host as we explore gardening on Earth and beyond. In the last episode, we heard from researcher Luke Fountain about his work investigating the nitrogen cycle. That's a collection of biological and geological processes that cycle nitrogen through Earth's ecosystems. From our school days, we're all familiar with similar cycles that show us how water and carbon move through our world. We rely on these processes to clean our water, deal with our waste and produce the oxygen we breathe. But when we're brave, or foolhardy, enough to blast off from Spaceship Earth, we have to find other ways to ensure our survival. Unfortunately, we haven't yet found a way to pack our ecosystem and take it with us. Science fiction often glosses over the details of how humans sustain themselves in space. Still, sometimes we see spaceships filled with plants as part of bioregenerative life support systems, biological systems that produce oxygen, scrub carbon dioxide, clean wastewater and provide food for the crew. Humans have been thinking about bioregenerative life support systems, referred to as BLSS, since the early days of space travel. Yet astronauts on the International Space Station rely on technical systems, referred to as physico-chemical systems, to recycle air and water. They depend on regular resupply rockets from Earth and have only had a few mouthfuls of space-grown food. Our friends at the Kennedy Space Centre recently published a new review article that looks back at the first 60 years of bioregenerative life support systems. Published in Frontiers in Astronomy and Space Science, it's called Supplemental Food Production with Plants, a review of NASA research. It explains that it takes around 40 square metres of crops grown under high-intensity lighting to produce enough food and recycle the atmosphere for one person. So although we've been conducting research into bioregenerative life support systems since the early days of spaceflight, our orbital experiments have been limited by mass, volume and energy supply. NASA's Controlled Ecological Life Support Systems, CELSS, program has been running since around 1980. It has mainly focused on large-scale systems that would grow staple crops, think wheat, maize and potatoes, on the Moon or Mars but it also proposed a smaller system that could grow supplemental food crops for astronauts in orbit or on their way to Mars, often referred to as a salad machine. And it's that concept that we see being developed on the International Space Station at the moment. NASA astronauts ate their first official bites of space-grown food in 2015. That was outrageous red romaine lettuce grown in the first of two veggie growth chambers installed on the ISS in 2014. A second veggie chamber followed in 2017, and the two were used together for the first time in February 2018. Since then, nine more crops have grown in veggie. Waldman's green lettuce, dragoon lettuce, Tokyo Bacana Chinese cabbage, Mitsuna, red Russian kale, wasabi mustard, extra dwarf pak choy and mara mustard, and Scott Kelly's famous zinnias. It's easy to assume that when something unexpected happens in an experiment, it has failed. But more often than not, and this is particularly true in an extreme environment like space, it's still a valuable learning experience. In December 2015, Scott Kelly posted a picture of the zinnias growing in veggie. They were sad-looking plants with mouldy leaves. Zinnias were chosen because growing them would get us a step closer to growing fruiting veg such as tomatoes and peppers in space, but they're more challenging plants to grow than lettuce. The zinnias were growing in plant pillows with wicks to supply their water. After a couple of weeks, Chell Lindgren noticed water seeping out of some of the wicks. As we heard from Mark Wiselogel in episode 29, water behaves differently in space. It tends to cling to anything within reach. The excess moisture had partially engulfed three of the zinnias. Scientists on the ground later saw guttation on some of the leaves. Guttation is what happens when a plant forces excess water out through its leaves. On Earth, you can sometimes see that on well-watered plants first thing in the morning. In veggie, it meant that the plants were experiencing high humidity. Some of the zinnia leaves were bending down and curling up, a condition called epinasty. Epinasty can indicate too much water around the roots. Taken together, these clues suggested that the zinnias needed more airflow. 
but an unplanned spacewalk took precedence. Before corrective action could be taken, some leaves started to die off and the plants were going mouldy. Scott Kelly was worried and rang Veggie Project Manager Trent Smith at 3.45 in the morning. Trent worked the rest of the Veggie team for an early morning conference and by 8am they had new procedures to send up to the ISS. Scott Kelly put on a dust mask, removed the dead and mouldy leaves and tucked them in the freezer to be analysed on Earth later. Then he wiped down Veggie and the remaining plants with sanitizer wipes and turned the fan up to dry out the chamber. But by Christmas Eve, Scott was worried the plants were too dry and couldn't wait for the next scheduled watering on December the 27th. So Scott suggested that he be given more control over how to take care of the plants. Trent Smith was elated. We'd been planning on figuring out how to garden autonomously and his request was just perfect. Christmas Eve 2015 was our gift, he said. So Scott Kelly became the first autonomous on-orbit gardener and the veggie team created a one-page zinnia care guide for him. As a result, Scott rescued two of the plants which started to form new leaves. And the rest, as they say, is history, because who could forget the memorable pictures Scott posted of his zinnia bouquet on Valentine's Day. Veggie has been amazingly successful, but it's not without its problems. It has shown us that watering plants in space is challenging and that the amount and quality of light are critical. It has also demonstrated the benefit of extensive ground testing of cultivars, as some varieties prove more tolerant of space flight conditions, including the high CO2 levels, than others. Veggie is surprisingly low-tech for a space garden with LED lighting, a ventilation fan and a clear plastic cover that expands like a concertina as plants grow. It relies on astronauts to inject water at suitable intervals. It doesn't have a lot of instrumentation to feed data back to mission control. The Advanced Plant Habitat, or APH, is quite different. But before we get to that, I'd like to take a second to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters and remind you that from just a pound a month, you can join our community of space gardeners and support the show. Visit patreon.com forward slash gardeners of the galaxy to find out more. Roughly the size of a mini fridge, the Advanced Plant Habitat is the largest plant growth chamber on the International Space Station. It offers plants more growing space and tests which environmental conditions work best for space plants. While veggie relies on the ISS atmosphere, the APH is fully enclosed and can regulate temperature, humidity, oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. Its settings can be adjusted for growing different types of plants and are monitored and controlled from Earth. That frees up crew time as the astronauts are only required to add water and occasionally replace things like ethylene and carbon dioxide scrubbers and filters. The APH also has an upgraded light array with white, red, blue, green and far red LEDs. In addition, each of the lights can be programmed individually, producing a wide range of light colours and intensities tailored to each plant's requirements. The APH was designed to support growth experiments up to 135 days in length and for a 10-year mission, making it sound a bit like Star Trek. The APH was assembled and installed in the Japanese Kibo module in 2018. Its first mission was a seven-week hardware validation test, growing Arabidopsis and Apogee dwarf wheat at the same time. The goal of the test was to confirm that the APH could measure fundamental plant responses to spaceflight conditions and that it could be controlled from Earth, including program changes to environmental conditions and photographic sequences. The two crops together were used to demonstrate crew procedures, planting protocols and watering schemes. Arabidopsis has a short life cycle. Harvesting the mature plants tested the APH's ability to contain plant debris. Meanwhile, the wheat plants cycled a lot of water through the system, testing root zone moisture control and the recovery of transpired water by condensation. The wheat canopy was also used to validate the ability of the APH to measure gas exchange of plants. After a successful validation test, the APH got down to some serious science. Its first experiment, PH01, was called an integrated omics guided approach to lignification and gravitational responses, the final frontier. Now, that's a mouthful. The short blurb about the experiment isn't much better. It says that Plant Habitat 1 compared differences in genetics, metabolism, photosynthesis and gravity sensing between various Arabidopsis plant lines grown in space and on Earth. This investigation was expected to provide key insights on major changes occurring in plants exposed to microgravity. Last year, we saw the results of the second experiment in the Plant Habitat series as astronauts were able to harvest and eat radishes for the first time. 
Dr. Carl Hassenstein joined us in episode 13 to talk about the space radish experiment while it was happening. He chose radishes because they are a small, quick-growing plant in the same family as Arabidopsis, helping us optimise plant growth in space. It also evaluated the nutrition and taste of the plants. PH03 hasn't flown yet, but I believe it will be another Arabidopsis experiment. I'm sure you've all been keeping tabs on PH04, though, because it's the world-famous space chilies. And, of course, NASA's Jacob Torres joined us to talk about how to grow chilies in space in episode 24. Growing a fruiting plant such as chilies is a considerable leap forward for NASA. Peppers are more challenging to cultivate than many other space crops because they take longer to germinate, grow and develop fruit. In fact, I believe PHO4 is the longest running space plant experiment, a record previously held by PESTO, NASA's Photosynthesis Experiment Systems Testing and Operations Investigation, in 2003. PHO4 includes a microbial analysis to improve understanding of plant-microbe interactions in space and an assessment of flavour and texture. As gardeners on Earth know, those vary based on the growth environment and things like the amount of water. Remember the humidity issue that affected the space zinnias? NASA has just had a similar experience with the space chilies. According to the space station logs, the crew had to check the APH after a report of high humidity levels in the plant growth chamber. They found a disconnected air hose and reconnected it. The ground team could then see that humidity levels were dropping back to normal. That was on the 19th of November, but by the time you listen to this, the PH04 experiment will be over. The crew will perform a final chilli harvest, stowing some of the fruit in the freezer for return to Earth and adding some spice to their meals with the rest. We saw Megan MacArthur making space tacos with her share of the last harvest. What do you think they'll make this time? So, as we say goodbye to PH04, what's next for the advanced plant habitat? It looks like it will be PH05, an experiment called Unlocking the Cotton Genome to Precision Genetics. That will cultivate several types of cotton that differ in their ability to regenerate into whole plants from undifferentiated masses of cells known as a cali. The experiment write-up says that cotton is highly resistant to the process of plant regeneration. That makes it challenging to engineer stable reproducing plants with specific or enhanced traits, such as drought resistance. PHO5 could provide a better understanding of this behaviour and how to overcome it. The principal investigator is Christopher Susky from Clemson University, and PHO5 is scheduled for expeditions 66 and 67, so we could be seeing cotton growing on the ISS again next year. Veggie and the APH are both very successful demonstration systems, but they can't be considered operational crop production systems. So what's the next step? We're just starting to see mentions from NASA of a new system called OHALO3. Now I have no idea to pronounce that, but I assume that the name is in reference to OHALO2, an archaeological site in Israel. OHALO2 is one of the best preserved hunter-gatherer archaeological sites, dating to around 23,000 years ago. It's significant for two reasons. The earliest brushwood dwellings and evidence for the earliest small-scale plant cultivation, some 11,000 years before the onset of agriculture. Scientists have found the remains of numerous fruits and cereals there, preserved in anaerobic conditions under silt and water. That's also extremely rare, as vegetable matter usually decomposes very quickly. So OHALO3 is NASA's next step towards space crop production and could arrive on the ISS as early as 2024. Like the APH, OHALO3 will be atmospherically closed to recycle transpired humidity and have automation and sensing capabilities. It is designed to be evolvable and expandable and will initially test different water delivery and volume optimization concepts for growing plants in microgravity. Intended as a permanent addition to the ISS, OHALO3 will investigate the operational challenges associated with the sustained production of crops in space. Although it won't provide data on life support integration, such as CO2 use and oxygen production, or the potential to recover nutrients from the waste stream, NASA hopes it will be the long-desired vegetable production unit for a Mars transit mission. It's also likely that we'll see OHALO3, or its successor, installed on the Lunar Gateway. That's it for this episode. All being well, Viga Vamalink will be joining us next time to discuss his research into growing plants in Martian and lunar soils. Don't forget you can sign up to support the show at patreon.com forward slash gardeners of the galaxy. 
Podchaser is a great place to review podcasts and you can find me there by searching for Gardeners of the Galaxy and I'm still posting daily space gardening photos on social media. You can find me at Orbital Gardens on Twitter and Instagram and Gardeners of the Galaxy has its own Facebook page. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control, confirming termination of your signal. We've heard from Mark Watney and he'd love to visit for dinner in the Space Garden. However, he does have a concern about the menu. Apparently he's sick of potatoes. Mission Control out.